Hi, this is Alex Vitale. Welcome to another episode of The Critical Criminologist. I'm super excited to be joined today by Brendan McQuay, author of Pacifying the Homeland, uh, University of California Press, right? Yep. Yep. Who is at University of Southern Maine. And uh, one of the things we share is that we're both graduates of Hampshire College, about a generation removed from each other. Uh, but that was a distinctive experience we both had. And I was um, lucky to uh, spend a little time with Brendan just recently in Portland, where we, we did an event on ending school policing. And he and I have been in conversation over the last few years after I came across some of his really interesting work on what I would call political policing, but tied to some, some broader questions. So, Brandon, can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the new book and some of the, the key ideas in it? So the book focuses on a um, you know, relatively obscure uh, counterterrorism program under the Department of Homeland Security, which are uh, called fusion centers. And what fusion centers are, are these interagency intelligence hubs where, you know, state or um, local police can access pretty much every type of information you can imagine, right? Everything that the government collects, both criminal justice records, census, social services, um, all, all, all the government records, uh, records from private data brokers, records from, you know, by created by new surveillance systems that the police might set up and run from the fusion centers, like social media scrapers and automated license plate readers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then they, you know, fuse this data, so to speak, to create, you know, new um, novel forms of, of intelligence. So these were set up in the aftermath of 9-11, of and they were supposed to, you know, connect the dots that ostensibly allowed the intelligence failure that, you know, made the 9-11 attacks possible. Uh, so I spent considerable time in two fusion centers and a series of other uh, county crime analysis centers. And what I found is that, you know, fusion centers, um, you know, are not a limited story of... Um, you know, security, counterterrorism, or criminal justice. They're part of a kind of new strategy of administration uh, that's salient across kind of multiple institutional domains. So as it regards to, you know, you know criminology in the state, uh, my main argument, the main argument in the book, is that intelligence fusion is enabling a shift in state strategy from uh, mass incarceration to mass supervision. So, you know, nationwide, the prison population has been declining for a decade now, yet uh, decarceration has not sw swung the penal pe pendulum back towards rehabilitation and reintegration. Instead, uh, surveillance and policing are filling the gap. So we have a reduction of the prison population, but we haven't addressed the punitive approach to the management of social problems that gave rise to mass incarceration. So what we have is, you know, a situation where particular neighborhoods, and in some cases entire cities, are kind of transformed into open-air prisons, where aggressive policing and a, a ubiquitous surveillance, perhaps punctuated with brief stays in county jails or participation in alternatives to incarceration, replace uh, lengthy prison sentences. So that, that's the kind of main thesis of the book. And, you know, in making that, I kind of push back against some of the arguments about fusion centers and try to make, you know, a broader contribution to the, you know, not just the punishment and society scholarship, but to state theory and to, you know, uh, theories of, of security. Now, this weaving of domestic, you know, anti-crime policing and anti-terror policing is definitely, I think, you know, one of the most interesting things about the book. Now, did you come at this initially through an interest in the anti-terrorism political policing or through domestic policing, or when, you know, when did you figure out the connection between these two things that was really happening in practice? Well, you know, it's funny. You go into the field looking for one thing, and you right. find something. So, you know, fusion centers are a thoroughly neoliberal project. They're premised on these public-private partnerships. And one of the things, one of the, the core public-private partnerships for fusion centers 
is you know partnerships for the protection of critical infrastructure so critical infrastructure can mean anything you know it can mean the power company it can mean you know um, transportation but it also can mean you know uh, big retail it can right, mean, right now it means grocery stores <laughs> yeah grocery stores uh, you know logistics Amazon delivery warehouses uh, universities so the, under this, you know, really broad category of critical infrastructure, fusion centers were supposed to work with the private sector to gather intelligence and to, you know, uh, provision security. So I was originally interested in these public-private partnerships, and I was interested in that kind of old, you know, political sociology question about the degree of, you know, business or capital influence on policy, right? Um, but when I got inside the fusion center... I found that, you know, these public part, pri these public private partnerships are quite limited. And instead, I found, you know, and it seems obvious looking back, but at the time it was kind of surprising, I found that the police were doing, you know, what police do, which is crime control, right? And there's there's a reason for that. You give, you know, you give the New York State Police 10 million dollars to set up an intelligence center you know, uh, ostensibly for counterterrorism, but you know, there's only so much terrorism to go around, right? There's and there's actually quite, 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 uh, quite limited amounts of of terrorism. So, you know, well, the originally, right? Originally, the designation for these centers was that they were just supposed to be about terrorism, but then there was this shift in formal policy to an all threats status, right? All threats, all crimes, all hazards. And this was really just a recognition, you know, an institutional recognition of, you know, the politically inconvenient reality for the project of the war on terror and homeland security. And that reality is, you know, terrorism is an exceedingly remote threat. And, you know, if you're interested in terrorism, the, the most salient terrorist threat isn't, you know, uh, Islamist organizations abroad. It's homegrown white supremacists. Uh, and all of that was quite politically fraught. So, you know, the mission quickly expanded, not just to crime control, but also emergency management. My very first trip to the, I think it was the third interview I did in the New Jersey Fusion Center, I interviewed this, um, you know, detective sergeant who was putting, who was m uh, managing all these intel analysts and who were putting together these massive link charts for a huge, um, you know, uh, anti-drug operation in Camden, New Jersey. And, you know, what that, you know, clarified in dramatic fashion in my first center is that, you know, the work that's going on here is the traditional work of policing. It's crime control from a more critical perspective. It's the, you know, the management of poverty and social problems. Um, you know, and it kind of shifted my analysis to focus on, shifted my project to focus on different questions, right? How did this you know, I wasn't interested in the public-private partnerships anymore. Uh, you know, questions of privacy became quaint and, you know, pedantic. Um, and instead, I was concerned, you know, I wanted to figure out how this massive investment in the name of security came to manage, you know, came to be used to punitively manage, you know, a city with acute social problems, you know, a city suffering with you know, uh, decades of deindustrialization, high crime, high poverty. Um, you know, wh why why did this come to be? And this is not to say that there isn't sort of high political policing going on in these places. You do see some of that, but that really that work in this moment, you know, pales in comparison to the use of this new technology to to focus on. Uh, more uh, everyday policing. Right. And, you know, I spent, there's a whole chapter in the book about political policing, and it's a term I struggle with, because on the one hand, you know, I want to say, well, all policing is political, right? right? And the most important forms of political policing is the routine, you know, administration of poverty that is uh, not viewed as political. It's just, it's just is. It's just what police do. Um, so there's that conversation to be had, right? But then on this more specific point about what we consider proper political policing, in-your-face political policing, going after collective, you know, organizations. Um, what I found 
you know, is that uh, this is very different than the Cointelpro days, where you had a very centralized operation, you know, with a very clear ideological premise, right? Hoover was a fanatical anti-communist and, you know, linked communism and civil rights and went after it all in a very aggressive fashion. What we have now instead is these, you know, it's not just fusion centers, it's, I could give you an alphabet soup of domestic, um, you know, intelligence operations. Some are more horizontally organized, some are more vertically organized, but they're all in this knotted, tangled mess. And the upshot of it is, is you have a system that's much more complicated uh, and open to local political pressures. So instead of finding a new Cointelpro, instead of finding this coordinated, you know, uh, project with a very clear and coherent ideological focus, what I found is, you know, um, different moments of political policing where certain, you know, political interests or capital interests could operate through these decentralized intelligence networks and like kind of mobilize the power of the state to crush political activity. So just to give two really quick examples, in the, in the example of Occupy, right, we saw some Occupy encampments, you know, get uh, cleared out with, you know, aggressive police operations. We saw some uh, other Occupy encampments negotiate with their withdrawal with local state, uh, local officials in exchange for, you know, in Providence, they, they, they opened a homeless shelter and Occupy Providence closed up. Um, in the example of, you know, the most aggressive uh, crackdowns of Occupy encampments, it wasn't DHS or the FBI, it was the Police Executive Research Forum in the National Conference of Mayors who organized conference calls and set in motion a series of evictions that, you know, in part operated through the Fusion Center intelligence sharing networks, but we can't say they began or were directed by Fusion Centers the same way that the you know, Cointelpro is directed by the FBI. So we see a similar story with uh, the policing of Dakota Access Pipeline and the No Dapple movement. The, you know, uh, energy transfer partners, the company hired a private contractor, Tiger Swan, that, you know, worked with the North Dakota Fusion Center, worked with, you know, state and federal law enforcement, but they kind of, to, to the extent that we know from the government documents, they assumed the most aggressive role and kind of pushed pushed the operation, right? They, they operated through the state, but it wasn't, you know, a piece of the state that was the clear, um, the clear uh, lead actor like, like we saw in the past. What, what I think this all means is that this is actually much more, um, you know, the, for political policing, it's much more um, harder to expose and redress because plausible deniability is kind of baked into the system, right? So you can look at no dapple and be like, oh, this is Tiger Swan, right? That's the issue here. It's private security. You can look at Occupy and say, well, you know, some encampments resolve this well, right? This is not, a, you know, a matter of repression. This is a matter of bad actors, right? And I think this, this is a more subtle and insidious form of political policing. You know, when the Citizens Commission to investigate the FBI broke in the FBI office. You know, Hoover was implicated, and it essentially brought him down. And it made forced the FBI to reform in ways that it has never had to since. When the Occupy documents were released, there wasn't the clear revelations. Of course, even, even for the Hoover example, that didn't really prevent local red squads from continuing to operate and to keep case files. And... You know, the, the history of political policing is always suffused with these public-private partnerships going back to, you know, Pinkertons being deputized as coal and iron police in Pennsylvania, you know, a hundred years ago. So uh, I found that really interesting that, that that pattern of public-private partnerships continues, but the form of it is constantly changing, morphing to deal with both the political environment and the level of perceived threat. Uh, which is not nearly as high today as, let's say, it was in the 1960s or the 1930s. Uh, you mentioned before that, you know, you understood this everyday policing as being fundamentally about the management of poverty or the management of a system that produces poverty and disadvantage. Uh, 
And I know that you're very influenced by the work of uh, Mark Neoclius and, and Joel Olson. So, sorry, I butchered his last name. Uh, but could you say a little bit about how you came across their work and how that shaped your own thinking on these questions? Right. Well, um, you know, Joel Olson, I kind of, I think I saw the book, um, uh, what is it, the White Democracy book, Abolition of White Democracy, cited in, cited somewhere, and then I ended up, you know, uh, getting into, getting into that, uh, and I found his, his work to be useful just to, um, you know, to think about, um, like, racial formation in the U.S., right, and think about its, uh, you know, it's multiple impacts on, you know, the state and uh, culture. Um, you know, I ended up kind of rolling Olson into um, kind of a, a, a broader uh, framework, right? That's kind of, um, you know, I view as a kind of the, the humanist and historical strands of, of Marxism. And here, you know... Um, here, I think Neil Klaus fits a little, um, a little more naturally with that tradition. I mean, I got into his work because, um, you know, it took me a while to find my niche in uh, academia. A lot of people that write on security are either, you know, administrative hacks, basically, who want to uh, refine the operations of the state, or they're kind of, you know, post-structuralists that I think you know, uh, we never, never made the blunt enough political analysis for my taste. So Neil Klaus was someone who is, you know, not just trying to develop um, a Marxist, a critical theory, a critical and materialist theory of security, but he also was, you know, going back to the origins of capitalist modernity, right? So he traces the origins of police, you know, far beyond the uniformed police to the deep origins of the police idea in the, you know, crisis of feudalism. Um, so as someone, my background is historical sociology and world systems. So he, he gave me a way to kind of talk about security and draw upon the, um, you know, m my link that to the, the way of thinking and the, the, the literatures I had command of, um, you know, as, as a result of that training. Uh, you know, what I think it all means is, you know, essentially in the book, the second chapter, I try to rewrite the history of the United States by looking at, like, four intertwined processes, right? So labor formation, uh, class, uh, racial formation, state formation, and pacification, right? And I try to develop this, like, holistic theory to show, you know, these two different moments of, two different state forms in American history and explain the, the nature of, you know, not just punishment and policing, but social policy, uh, class composition, uh, you know, the, the political dynamics. Because uh, to me, that's the, you know, that's, it's that historical context that makes, you know, makes these little things we study intelligible. You know, and if you leave out that, if you leave out the whole and just focus on the parts, you end up, you know, you end up being a um, a technician of power, right? You end up studying some little thing, and despite yourself uh, recommending how to make it better, right? And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, uh, you know, um, try to go for that ruthless critique of all that exists, right? So uh, there was, you know, an article in, in Jacobin recently, an interview with uh, Adner Usani about his and Clegg's uh, piece about the economics of mass incarceration, where they take a Marxist analysis that argues against the kind of um, racial justice analysis that we see in the new Jim Crow and Elizabeth Hinton's work and others and says, you know, actually what we need is a class analysis. The reason that uh, we don't have a proper welfare state is because we don't have strong unions and a unified working class, uh, and that we can't understand mass incarceration through simply a racial justice lens. But is there a way in which that 
analysis can be too class reductive. So how, how do we, you know, uh, how do we reconcile the fact that the majority of people killed by police are actually white, but clearly race is like a fundamental shaping of these institutions. So I know you explore this issue in your book a little bit, and maybe you could tell us how you, you think about this relationship. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm trying to thread the needle between those two positions, between the kind of uh, anti-racist social justice um, analysis that I think tends to focus on politics and uh, at the expense of everything else. So, you know, it's about elites, it's about policy formation, it's about, you know, uh, voting patterns, you know, um, uh, with, you know, with the kind of uh, Usami and Clegg's are, uh, articulation, which I think is a really, you know, they have a, a flat analysis of a class on paper, right? So it's a, you know, um, you know, everything they say is empirically true, but it's also kind of a, um, a distortion of, of, you know, the, the seemingly precise, you know, measurement they're taking, right? So what do I mean by this? So, uh, Clegg, if you look at the, you know, New Jim Crow, if you look at Elizabeth Hinton, I mean, they just don't seriously engage with political economy, right? And to me, that's, you know, that's um, just a major shortcoming, right? Uh, so if you read, if you read um, Hinton's book, um, what, War on Poverty to War on Crime, right? Yeah. Uh, it basically sounds like, you know, it's all just a mass incarceration is the, you know, the political uh, response to black power, period, right? And it's not about, you know, the 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 early onset of deindustrialization and the way that impacted, disproportionately impacted black workers who were kind of had the weakest toehold in the labor market, right? So to me, you know, as someone who's a, you know, historical sociologist, a, a Marxist, uh, that's deeply un, unsatisfying, right? But then if we look at, uh, you know, the, the other direction, right, like class is more than, you know, it's, it's, it's not just a class on paper, right? It's a politically organized constituency, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, collect, a form of collective subjectivity, right? And if we look at the history of the United States, it's kind of absurd to try to disentangle um, class and race, right? It just doesn't, you can't do it, right? Uh, and this is not to say that race and class are the same, but that there are two moments, or there are two uh, moments, yeah, there are two moments in a process of, of subject formation, right? So what I do in my book is I try to say, um, you know, I draw on neoclass and this idea of pacification, right? And that the state needs to, the primary function of the state, the primary work the state does is to administer poverty and continually recreate the working class. So if we look at the origins of of race in the United States, right, uh, in many ways it's Bacon's Rebellion, right? It's, the, you know, uh, you know, in, in the 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 practice. practice. Right, and it's, it's, it's divide and rule, right? Like the indentured servants, the white indentured servants in the the black slaves rose up against the, you know, colonial economy, burnt down Jamestown, you know, a serious rebellion. And what was the response? It was, it was black codes. It was drawing the, you know, drawing a, a clear division between, you know, uh, elements of the working class racialized as white and the elements of the working class uh, racialized as black, right? And then we can, we can tell this story through time. Right, we can trace the develop the intertwining of race and class in the United States as the United States mer mer uh, transforms from a you know agricultural mercantile economy to an industrial power to a post-industrial power, and you know uh, we can you know trace the intertwined nature of race and class dynamics. So if we go back to you know the uh, Usami and Clegg piece, right, they make the case that um, the U.S. has, you know, has mass incarceration because we don't have a strong labor movement, right? And it's all about class power, right? And that's, you know, it's, well, why don't we have a strong labor movement? 
right? It's because the, the color line ran through the United States and divided the working class. And, you know, I quote uh, James Boggs' article from The Black Scholar where he talks about how, um, you know, black workers basically were a countervailing tendency to, um, you know, to capital accumulation. They were a depressed labor that could be used to, you know, uh, could be put into industries that were no longer uh, competitive, right? It was basically an internal, you know, the old internal colony argument, right? And that this was a, you know, this was a way of, you know, not only um, diffusing, um, you know, class antagonisms through racial conflict, but also was a way, you know, something that made American capitalism dynamic, right? It right. made American capitalism uh, work. So, you know, when we trace this to the present, you know, I think Clegg and Usami are right in when they acknowledge, um, you know, just the reality of the situation, right? That, that um, you know, that uh, you're more likely to be incarcerated as a non, as a, as a white person without a high school degree than you are as a, you know, a black person with a college degree. Like, that's an important point to make. We need to understand how we got there and we need to understand, you know, for example, the, the way all these politics are, you know, profoundly racialized. And when I say these politics are profoundly racialized, I don't mean it's just about you know, uh, so-called racial minorities, right? Like, you know, politics quote, coded as white is is racial. So just in the same way, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, capital and class as you can't disentangle them, right? You can't disentangle uh, race from labor and you can't, you know, disentangle racially subordinated populations from racially dominant ones. So uh, for me, I think this is a distinction between, you know, class as a historical concept, right, uh, class, uh, you know, class composition versus that's, you know, my approach, and then class as an analytic concept, the class on paper, which I think is, uh, you know, what Usami and, and Clegg take up. Our class is rooted in specific historical practices, and these include, you know, racial formation, colonialism, et cetera, and those things can't just be imagined away. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that some of my doctoral students struggle with who want to be critical criminologists is access to research sites, access to police departments and prisons. And I was so struck by the fact that you were able to get access to two of these fusion centers. And how did you manage to do that? Well, um... <laughs> First, uh, you know, some stubbornness and blind faith goes a, goes a very long way. So um, what I did is I, um, you know, I failed to get a research grant. I was writing this as a PhD student, PhD student in Binghamton, New York. I looked up every fusion center I could that, that was nearby. So basically the southern New England and the mid northern mid-Atlantic states. And... I wrote formal letters to them all, and I started, um, you know, followed up. So I had a Monday morning ritual for, for months of cold calling, mm. you know, secret police intelligence centers and just <laughs> being persistent, right? And then eventually calling their law enforcement partners and other agencies. So in the methods appendix of the book, I talk about, like, you know, the wall of official secrets. And really mm. what I did is just hit my head against the wall until I made my own cracks. And eventually I found, you know, the New, New, the New Jersey Fusion Center for reason, it was run by the state police and uh, for reasons particular to that agency's history, it has a very unique public profile. So New Jersey was one of, you know, in the 90s, they entered a consent decree with the uh, Department of Justice about racial profiling and part of the reforms that... This was part of the driving while black uh, movement. Right. So in the late 80s and into the 90s, uh, and part of those reforms um, were this shift to smarter policing, right? Intelligence-led policing. We're not, you know, prejudiced. It's, it's smart policing. It's driven by data. Uh, so they've made the Fusion Center uniquely public. It's part of their kind of re-legitimation strategy. It's, you know, it's, 
you know, and they have more relationships with media. They're more present in media. They've had, they facilitated other PhD students. So they let me in. And then once I got my foot in the door, it was a lot easier to snowball out from there. There also was, you know, and this, we can talk about, um, you know, talk about research, research ethics. I um, didn't really go undercover, but I, you know, if you Googled me back in 2013, you know, not much would come up. And if you really did your homework, you would realize that I'm a lefty and probably not sympathetic to the police. But I don't think anyone did that. And Despite instead, it being an intelligence gathering operation. Well, yeah, <laughs> right? That tells you something about, you know, their due diligence. Um, so I just went in there and, you know, I played up the naive student card, you know, and the fusion centers are, a, they're kind of the low hanging fruit in the intelligence community. And within the commu intelligence community, they're not, um, they have a bad reputation as being kind of amateurs. So these, these guys don't get a lot of people coming to them saying, you know, tell me about how cool you are and how cutting edge your work is. So they were happy just to, to go on. You know, it would be funny. There was often times where someone would say, I can't tell you that it's classified. And I learned just to pause and wait because they were just, you know, puffing up their feathers and then they were going to tell me anyway. Right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you learn to, you know, you, you learn kind of interview cues, you take it from there. Um, I, I don't think I could do this research now, uh, given, you know, what happens when you Google me <laughs> now. Um, you know, I may have salted the earth behind me. Maybe the New Jersey uh, Fusion Center is more hesitant to let people in. But uh, for me, it felt like, um, you know, I felt okay doing it because I felt like the access was worth it. And, um, you know, someone needed to blow the doors off Fusion Center. So I, I don't know if I did that with my heavy academic text, but, you know, the I, I was ultimately comfortable with the, the choices I made. Yeah, you remind me, you know, how important the extended pause is in a good <laughs> interview, right? Because people will generally fill that silence if we give them the space to do it. Advice for researchers out there. You know, you have this, uh, this great blurb on the back from, uh, from Miriam Kaba. This book challenged us to ask better questions about how carcerality connects to capitalism and to the state. You know, she's such an important figure in community organizing uh, around uh, the carceral state, so to speak. How did you make connection with her? So after, so I did my PhD at Binghamton, and when I was almost done with, when I was in the middle of writing the dissertation, I got a job at DePaul University. Uh, so I moved out to Chicago, and I heard about We Charge Genocide. And they were doing a, at the time, they were doing, when I first moved there, they were had just finished compiling this research project on, on a police brutality in Chicago. And they were going to the UN uh, Convention on Torture to testify. And I, you know, I read about... Mirroring the We Charge Genocide movement of, you know, 60 years previously. Right, right. So they were riffing on, I think it was 1949... Uh, well, but the Civil Rights Congress, I think it was, uh, brought this report to the UN, and they were kind of, you know, drawing on that. Um, they focused, I think, the original We Charge Genocide focused on um, lynching. lynching, right? And yeah. this this was focused on police brutality. But it, you know, it was the same, you know, a, uh, a similar project. Definitely same arguments to be made and same kinds of evidence. Right. So I read about that and I was like, wow, this is this is great work. And I, you know, just got in touch with uh, people from We Charge Genocide, you know, and it, you know, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't ex exactly uh, welcomed in the group as a, um, you know, as a friend, but I was welcomed as a comrade and respected as one. So I started doing work, uh, helping them write FOIA requests. And, 
Um, eventually, this kind of side project grew out. They were doing a, uh, observations of community policing meetings. And I ended up, you know, helping the organization uh, write up their report on that. Um, and uh, this was important because community, this was in the late Obama administration. And community policing was being put forward as the solution to, you know, the post-Ferguson crisis of police legitimacy. And in Chicago, it was, you know, the, the, the response to Laquan McDonald, right? We're going to, uh, do you know, the, this police commissioner was going to do this listening tour. And we were worried that they were going to rebrand their, you know, Chicago has the oldest, most thoroughly studied community policing program in the U.S. Yep. And we were afraid that they were just going to cynically rebrand that. So we did this report, did this study, and wrote this report to kind of, uh, punch back at you know what what we assumed was coming, which is uh, you know uh, community alternative policing strategy 2.0. So it was through that work that I got to know I got to know Miriam, and um, after I left Chicago, I went to SUNY Cortland, and she went to New York City. You know, I brought her to speak at SUNY Cortland. Uh, you know, we've kept in in you know, in contact, sometimes she'll email me with a, you know, with a question, uh, you know, I asked her to blurb my book for, you know, um, self-interested reasons, right? I knew that Pete, that it would, it would send a message to act the activist audience that I wanted to reach that like, you know, whoa, this dude has got somebody's ear who's important. And I also knew that, you know, from our, my discussions with Miriam about, um, you know, about the community policing report. And then in general, I knew that she was sympathetic to the, to the work and to the project. And, you know, um, you know, it was, you know, Miriam is probably one of the most effective organizers I've ever met in terms of, you know, developing, developing leaders and develop, you know, empowering people, you know, and building uh, real organizations and but not just building real organizations, like, you know, the old term is like training cadre. I mean, she, I, pe she, like, it, you know, people in Chicago wear bent pins that say Miriam taught me, right? I mean, she wasn't just, I mean, any, anybody can, or a lot of people can give a, a stirring lecture at a, or a stirring speech at a, at a um, demonstration or get people out to, a, you know, to vote. It's not a lot of people who can train you know, reproduce themselves, train new organizers, set up new organizations, you know. So, um, you know, Miriam is a recovering sociologist, right? And I think, you know, she viewed this as, you know, as kind of, you know, part of, you know, as that the the more intellectual aspects of her of her of her of her political work, you know. Right. Well, you laid out a kind of model for sociologists to engage social movements, not going to study them, not trying to be part of the inner circle, but saying, you know, you're doing your thing. How can I help? What can I do that adds value to what you're doing and building up that relationship of trust over time? Have right. you been able to, to develop similar relationships where you are in Portland, Maine? Yeah, I mean, in Chicago, it was easy to to participate in social movements as like uh, intellectual, because you know there was literally I used to teach a social movements class at DePaul, and it was um, the thing the main project was uh, do a research paper on a local movement, and you have to gather primary sources, you have to read their literature, you have to observe their activities. You know, there's literally, there's an organization working on almost any issue that you could possibly imagine there. So I was able to plug in, you know, in Chicago, I was able to plug into an organization that existed, you know, and play a specific role. So I came to We Charge Genocide in my first meeting, and there was a FOIA group, and I just went over and talked to them, and they were like, oh my God, thank you. You can, you can do all this for us, right? Uh, you have this somewhat, it's not a terribly difficult skill, but it's, it's got its quirks. So, you know, I was able to do that. Uh, when I moved to upstate New York, I was in a different circumstance, or moved back to upstate New York. The groups there were much smaller, and it was kind of like everyone 
had the had a much more you know if two or three people left the organization would collapse so people's roles weren't so specialized so everyone kind of did everything here at um you know in in maine i'm getting involved in the um you know local dsa and um you know getting involved in you know as you know uh, the debate on uh, school resource officers and uh, facial recognition so in both uh, on both these were issues that were kind of uh, had been pushed to the fore by you know local progressive politicians and you know DS the local DSA chapter you know was trying to organize with them and I was able to you know come in and kind of um, add some more momentum and energy to those efforts so before you know before the uh, social distancing lockdown we were about to launch a referendum a series of referendums uh referenda you know the two that i was focused on were a um a municipal facial recognition man and a a um a supervised injection facility um you know so i mean to me i went into I was in high school when 9/11 happened. The you know the war in Iraq was you know a very uh, influential event for me, and you know I went into academia to do politics by other means. Um, so um, you know I like being able to plug into organizations and use my my uh, training and special skills. But you know I um, you know I am reminded of um, you know. After the 2008 crash, David Harvey did a lecture, and he just said, like, at the end of it, he was like, well, what should you do? Every sensible person should join an anti-capitalist social movement. So, I, show that, I show that video in class all the time. Right. So, so you know, um, so, yeah, I, a lot of times the opportunities are, are structure what you can do. You know, and I've been lucky, particularly in Chicago, to, to have some have some opportunities that make me look uh cooler than i am <laughs> right or more you know pol you know more politically connected than i am um you know but i've always yeah i always try to find find somewhere to plug into right uh you mention in the book and in in your description your concern about the expansion of the sort of surveillance capacity of the state as, as a kind of cautionary tale about the potential reduction of like bricks and mortar prisons, and we've seen I've seen a little of this tension even like in ASC and in other settings where there's like a, a history of prison abolitionist thinking that does not necessarily extend to policing abolition. Is that has that been your experience? Do you do you see that similar tension? Oh, definitely. I mean, I do think, like, um, when people think of the term abolition, you know, if they have a modern reference, if it's not just anti-slavery abolitionists, it tends to be penal abolition. And for me, you know, penal abol, you know, I understand the focus because prison is the um, the most extreme denial of, of freedoms, and it's a, uh, you know, well, except for the police killing you. Well, right, right. Well, you know, and on, on that issue, like the um, the pr prison is the the ending, the end point of the judicial process, right? And a lot of people get sorted out much earlier. And you know, as you stated, a lot of people get sorted out in a much more terrible fashion, right? Extrajudicial, extrajudicial police murders, right? But then, as you know, I think there's also something there's a more important reason to focus on, on police. And it's not just because, you know, there's almost um, what, a million police officers in the U.S. and they're an occupying army, right? It's because of the, the extremely, the, the central role of police power to the modern state. And when I mean the modern state, I mean like the capitalist state, the state that started to consolidate in the 16th century. Right, and if you look at the original definition of policing, it wasn't 
it wasn't law and order. It wasn't even, you know, and it wasn't connected to these uniformed bodies of armed men. Police was a, a general, um, you know, a, a police organized a, a broader conversation that was concerned with the promotion of commerce and the management of poverty. And out of what at what was called police science emerged modern social policy, you know? And when I, you know, so when I think of, uh, you know, the abolition of policing, it's not just all the wonderful things you wrote about in your book, but it's about reimagining social policy and reimagining social policy in a way that's beyond administering poverty and a mo beyond fabricating the market, right? So I really think what, you know, um, so Foucauldians have been talking about the state, rethinking the role of the state in some profound way. It's the, it's the pra abolition is the practice of, 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 uh, you know, uh, transforming collective authority, transforming the state, right? So Foucauldians talk about the search for a left governmentality. My colleague, George Rogakos at Carleton University, um, talks about we need a socialist police science that's, you know, focused on the technical aspects of post-capitalist order. To me, this left governmentality, this socialist police science already has a name, it's abolition, right? And we need to kind of broaden our understanding of abolition beyond, you know, uh, punishment narrowly defined and beyond the criminal justice system narrowly defined and think about, you know, um, collective practices of order making. So Angela Davis in the collection of interviews called Abolition Democracy, she kind of riffs off um, Du Bois on abolition, and she says that, you know, it's not just the negative task of tearing down oppressive institutions, it's this positive task of, like, building up a new politics, and radical reconstruction, you know, was an example of this, but also a failure, and if you think about what radical reconstruction was, I mean, yeah, there was stuff about, you know, there was stuff that we would, that would fall under criminal justice, but it was also about, like, land reform, and yeah. political development and like you know training people to to run for elected office you know it was about uh you know politics uh as a whole right? yeah um and so that's giving people uh, the tools for economic self-sufficiency right exactly right so i mean the the next work i'm doing is trying to push push this try to like kind of develop Try to expand our, our thinking on abolition, you know, as a, I don't know, I'm still working on the language, uh, insurrectionary process of state formation, uh, counter hegemonic state formation, uh, I don't know, uh, we'll see in a couple of years if I can come up with the <laughs> right terms, but, uh, you know, just, just to, to kind of grasp the, you know, the, the, the multifaceted work of, of uh, making political order and grounding that, you know, on 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 material basis, on the level of social reproduction. You know, that's what the criminal justice system is about. It's about reproducing the working class. It's about social reproduction, right? So, you know, and that's what social policy is about. That's Piven and Cloward's famous argument, right? It's about labor. It's about manage social welfare. Is about managing the labor market. That's a uh, what is it? Gintis and Bowles in education, right? School in capitalist America. So um, let's let's flip the script and bring bring all these concerns together and start developing a coherent conversation, right? I think that's what abolition is, but it's not fully aware of its uh, awesome reach in power. It's not just about you know tearing down the prisons or even you know disarming the police. It's about imagining the kind of world that that we really want and figuring out strategies to to. Attain that, attain that, and understanding that the empowerment of the criminal justice system is inherently an impediment to accomplishing any of that. Right. The place I've arrived at now in this like kind of nascent research project is that like the, you know, uh, the antithesis of police, so to speak, you know, is the commons, right? Because yeah. you know, if you look at these old police scientists I wrote about, they were all focused on basically just destroying the commons and forcing people to work. And police was the way you do that. 
and it wasn't just you know it wasn't just the arm it wasn't just you know physical coercion right it was a number of social policy mechanisms so to me well, the the one of the precursors to the london metropolitan police right was the was the force working the docks yeah, that was designed to prevent the historical practice of gleaning right. where dock workers took home broken cates and cases and spillage as part of their understood earnings right. and the role of that police force was to prevent that practice and to focus their compensation only on wages tightly managed by the employer Right, and what you're talking about as gleaning is an example of, you know, what people like Peter Leinbach talk about as commoning, right? It's this yep. this shared practice where, you know, the dock workers they control not only they control the conditions of the work, they decide how the ship is going to be unloaded, blah blah blah, but it's also like the property the, the itself. It, it isn't a commodity, right? It's a common right. that like they control the dock, so something that passes through the dock, you know, becomes at least in part their resource, right? Uh, whereas what the Thames River Police were trying to do was just impose private property in, yep. you know, in that moment being at the origins, like it's, it's very explicit. But I think yes. we see the same thing going on in, like if you look at homeless policing, it's absurd, right? It's insane. Like the most cost effective thing is housing first. It's cheaper just to give people no, no, yes. you know, put them in houses. So why do we waste all the, you know, waste? all this money on these networks of shelters and blah, blah, blah. It's all about, you know, maintaining uh, housing as a commodity, yeah, right? Property. Yeah. Forcing people into participation in, you know, wage labor so yeah. they can avoid the misery of homelessness. It's interesting in this, in this current crisis, though, we see the state in a period of like total free fall reaching for basically socialist solutions and even right. communist solutions. So we, there were articles today in New York about repurposing tourist hotels into hospitals. And what I, I, I sent out some stuff on social media yesterday saying this should, this not only should it be hospitals, but it should be homeless shelters. It should be refugee centers. You know, let's put those things to public use rather than just sites for, for profit. Let me ask you uh, if, you know, what you're reading, what you like, are there a couple of books you want to recommend to people that, uh, that you think are uh, helpful with some of these questions or well, other areas? One book I would recommend, and I think it's one I think everyone's sleeping on, is called The Upper Limit by Francois, I guess, Bonnet, uh, who's... Uh, I don't know where he's from. It came out in University of California Press, uh, 2019. He's a professor somewhere in France, but it goes back to the old, the old political economy of punishment, and you know to go back to our earlier discussion about the the uh, Usami and Clegg piece. I think that shows this book makes makes an argument that's totally consonant with theirs that focuses on capital and class in a very serious and significant way, but without kind of reducing class to this flat sociological construct, like showing, you know, and specifically his thesis is basically, you know, the United States used to have, there's this term that comes out of the political economy of punishment called less eligibility, which basically means that the, the, the limit of social policy and penal policy, how generous social policy is, how rehabilitative the prison system will be. It, the limit is set by the conditions of the, the you know, the worst job available in the labor market. Yeah. You know, so his his thesis is we had two systems of less eligibility, one in the South and one in the North, and the Great Migration created a political crisis where it was either expand, you know, the Northern system of less eligibility, which was kind of totally in line with Western Europe, in some ways ahead of Western Europe, or, you know, uh, contract to a, uh, to the brutal system that we have today, right? So that's, that's a great book. It's pretty short. It's readable. You know, it's a great, it does a nice job of combining, um, um, you know, he does ethnographic observations in East New York and, you know, combines that with nice, um, 
a nice historical perspective and some pretty hardcore political economy. So that's that's a, a, a book I'm really enjoying or really enjoyed recently. Right now I'm reading Peter Limebaugh's, um, what is it, Red, Red Hot, Hot and Burning. Uh, it's basically one of the chapters from Many-Headed Hydra that's blown up into its own book, and it's about uh, Ned and Kate Despard, who were these, um, you know, essentially uh, Kate Despard was a Creole uh, uh, woman from Honduras, and Ned Despard was an Anglo-Irish uh, elite who basically became a class trader. And the book's about their kind of failed, their role in the, you know, the upri uh, uprising in Ireland and their kind of travels across, you know, multiple continents, both in Ireland and the New World. And, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm not quite done with this one yet. But, oh, yes, that's good. That's good. That's good. Well, Brendan, I want to thank you so much for, for taking time out to, to talk with me today and to everyone out there listening. And if you haven't yet, go out and get your copy of Pacifying the Homeland from UC Press. And if you enjoyed this conversation and you want to see more like it, be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel. And you can also follow me on Twitter at, at a Vitali. And... Uh, Stay tuned for more. Thanks again, Brendan. Thank you, Alex. It was my pleasure. Bye-bye.